My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Wednesday, April 24th, 2013, and I'm interviewing Bill Five, Secretary of Creek Nation at the Tribal Offices here in Okmulgee. Uh, Bill, I could be interviewing you about any number of accomplishments. You're a former chief of Muscogee Creek Nation. You're a living legend honoree. And your entire family has contributed to the artistic and cultural and political scene here in Creek Nation. But today we're going to focus on your military service. And thank you for taking the time to talk with me. You're welcome. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born at Claremore Indian Hospital, Claremore, Oklahoma but I grew up at the, in the Graham Wilika community down on the North Canadian River. Spent a lot of time on the river. <laughs> <laughs> I went to grade school at uh, Graham, Graham School. It's a public school, rural school. I spent eight years there. And then I went to Shilako Indian School in 1956 graduated in 1960, and after high school, I uh, attended OSU in Stillwater for a year, and uh, dropped out after that year, spent a uh, year and a half at Connors, Connors State oh, yeah. College in Warner, Oklahoma. Uh, after that little education experience, I went to uh, OSU Okmulgee. I graduated with a certificate in drafting and uh, worked at uh, Foster Wheeler Corporation, Houston, Texas for a while until I got drafted into the United States Army. So I went to the Army, spent two years in the Army, went to uh, basic training at Fort Bliss, Texas, eight weeks, and uh, I was sent to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina uh, to be, I guess, deployed from there to Vietnam. I was in the Signal Corps, went to school with a, 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 many of the people I went to school with at OSU Okmulgee also either joined or got drafted into the Army, and they had uh, technical degrees in electronics and refrigeration, different skills and crafts such as that. And so we were all stationed in the Signal Corps, 337, 337th Signal Company of the 37th Signal Corps. And we're talking about what years um, this was in 1966. Okay. In uh, August of 1966 is when I went went to the army, and I got out in August of '68. Uh, I see. So there was probably several other um, Creek tribal members that were in the Signal Corps with you. Well. Yes, there were uh, several. Uh, some had. Uh, were drafted and decided that they'd go ahead and join the for another year. And so they spent three years, whereas I only spent two. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is kind of uh, early in the war. Um, what was your job at the Signal Corps and how, how did you train for that? I guess they're kind of specialized. Uh, my training in, in uh, school at OSU Okmulgee was for drafting. When I got in the uh, military, they had a, a military occupational status of, uh, I think it was 81, 87. And uh, it was for a draftsman illustrator. So when I got over in, well, when I, while I was in the, uh, in North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I worked in the uh, general's office, and uh, what we did was uh, we uh, kept his organizational charts up to date and things such as that. It was, wasn't a hard job, but it was just kind of tedious sometimes. And we took orders from those, those high, highly ranked officers of the Army there. And that, that was basically what I did there. Now, when I went to Vietnam, it was a different story. They didn't need an illustrator over there or a draftsman. 
we were in a signal signal company and the things that we did were uh, take our uh, equipment and uh, our technicians would go to different locations in Vietnam, all over Vietnam, and uh, set these set this signal equipment up, set up towers and uh, uh, different types of uh, antennas and signal equipment. And uh, from time to time, they would need uh, uh, some of this equipment transferred from Da Nang, where we were stationed. That was our base station, Da Nang, South Vietnam. Uh, and I volunteered to be a courier for, the, for our company, which allowed me the opportunity to escort this equipment from our home base to wherever our people were located or in station. So I got to see uh, most of the uh, South Vietnam country. And uh, it was uh, during a time of war, you know, we didn't know when anything was going to happen. We just had to be ready for anything that came our way. Uh, I've uh, I was once when I had to, uh, well, I, I escorted some equipment to uh, about the center of Vietnam. And in coming back to Da Nang, which was about 50 miles from the DMZ south of Hue, uh, the, the uh, transport plane that I had to catch went to Saigon and then back to Da Nang. And we landed in Saigon. It didn't. We didn't know how long we were going to be there. Just whenever a flight was scheduled to come back our way. So uh, that uh, airport there in Saigon, Thompson Nuke Airport, had been bombed about twelve days in a row, and this was the thirteenth day. And uh, those rocket attacks were coming every night. Mm. And for some reason, that night, they didn't get any attacks. And then the next day, I got flown out back to uh, Da Nang. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, an exciting trip there because I didn't know what to expect. And, right. you know, we, we were just kind of on our own whenever we were escorting equipment. Of course, we had our rifle with us and flak vest and everything that we needed, helmets. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a, uh, it was an interesting tour over there. Did um, did the landscape? What kind of? I understand it was kind of hard to set up s communications and because of the landscape. The landscape. They had a lot of mountains over there, and then down in the in the valleys, you know, it was it was mountainous everywhere, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was a lot of Agent Orange used over there, and some of the mountains were just clear. You know, so they had no already vegetation. been using it. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, it was a uh, pretty powerful chemical that mm -hmm. they were using over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, some, sometimes, some locations, our boys would uh, fly in, and they'd slow that C-130 down to about 10 miles an hour and they'd have to jump out while it's still running because they were getting bombed or rocketed there 24 hours a day. They'd slow down and they'd jump out of the plane and throw their equipment out and they'd roll to a bunker. And uh, they had to do it that way. And you know, that's, it pretty, it's pretty dangerous for our troops over there, but then the mm -hmm. plane would go ahead fly back up in the air and mm. move on. But uh, I didn't have to go to that location. And uh, the, uh, but some of our boys went there and, and they they would tell me about it when I'd see them. Because mm -hmm. they'd come in, come back to our uh, main base from time to time. But as I went out to see these, or escort this equipment to them, sometimes I'd be there for a week or two, mm -hmm. waiting to 
get some orders to come back to our home base. So it was interesting. Before I volunteered to do that, they uh, they let me uh, work around the base, and I was uh, I would do illustrations for the dining hall. They had a Snoopy. They wanted that <laughs> Snoopy up there on the on the wall, so I painted one of those. I didn't never painted one before, but I figured it out and put it up there, and. Uh, and, and other than that, I was uh, on guard duty most of the time. What were your, um, just backing up a little bit, I guess, did you go directly from the States to Vietnam or did you fly to Europe and stop over for a couple of days? No, we, we, uh, we convoyed our equipment to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and loaded it on a ship and they took it directly to Da Nang. We flew to uh, Oakland, California, got on a ship and spent 28 days floating to, we, we made one stop and that was in uh, Okinawa. And then three days later, we were at Da Nang. Now, that was the first time you'd been on a ship, is yes, that right? Yes. What, what was that like, 28 days on the ocean? It was like uh, you didn't see anything but water. <laughs> <laughs> and you felt like you were just sitting still, bouncing up and down, just floating up and down on that ocean. We didn't have any bad weather during that time. You know, it was in August, so uh, we floated over and there wasn't anything to do. We had about 3,000 troops on that transport ship. I don't even remember the name of it, but uh, we would... You didn't have any problems with seasickness or something? No, it never bothered me. Some of the boys it did, mm -hmm. but I never had a problem with it. Um, that one stopover in um, Hawaii, did you get to go out a little bit? And well, it was Okinawa. Okinawa. Oh, I'm sorry. Japan. We we uh, we got off the ship. They said, "Okay, boys, you can go to that PX. I mean, uh, service club. It's right over here. Just go in there, and we'll give you all a few hours there, and then you come back to the ship. Get back on the ship, and we'll be shipping out." So everybody went off the ship, and it was about 110 degrees out there, and that. It's a hot sun. So we went in that service club and most of those boys got whiskeyed up and you know when we came out well it was uh, that hot sun hit them. Some of them passed out and most of the others went down to the uh, local town area and we went down there and it took them the rest of the day and night to round us all back up and put us on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like um, your, the basic training, do you feel like that prepared you for the experience and, and how? Well, I think it did. The main thing it did was it would provided us discipline. And it also provided us physical exercise that got us prepared physically for whatever we were going to be faced with. We had experience in uh, uh, weapons, hand-to-hand -hand combat, different things such as that. And uh, pretty much, uh, I think that, you know, if, if I had to, if I was going to be anything in the military, I would have rather been a sniper. Because at the time, my eyesight was about 2015 and I could really see good, and I could hit those targets at 300 yards. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, those, some of those things I've often thought about, but, you know, it wasn't what I did when I got over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was, uh, I think that the uh, basic training, it was kind of before uh, discipline was lightened up in the military 
and uh, they they would still discipline you pretty good if you got out of line or you didn't follow orders. So we knew we knew how far we could stretch the line there, and we always tried to stay within the limits of that and do do the things that we needed to do to get by. And you know it was it was a, a good experience after is over with and it uh, it made you more mature it uh, I guess it once you got out uh, once I got out of the army I went back to school and I didn't go to every school around the area and stay there for two or three semesters and leave to go to another one but uh, it was uh, I was more mature and uh, I kind of, I really appreciated uh, going through there. And my uncle was really proud of me because he he had been in some of the first uh, bombing missions in Japan. Mm. He was a tail gunner on one of those big bombers. And uh, he'd make fun of me while I was home. I mean, before I went to the army. He said, if that boy, if that war keeps going on over in Vietnam, that boy's going to be the smartest person in the county. Because I'd go to school, this school and that school, and finally I finished one and then I got drafted into the army. And he was really glad because he had joined, you know, oh. he joined the army. When I think back in the 40s, early 40s, and late 30s, when those wars broke out, I think that uh, our soldiers were more dedicated to service to the country at that time. Now, when I went in the Army, there were a lot of uh, conscientious objectors, and some of our boys would run off to Canada. In my company, though, at North Carolina, before we uh, went to Vietnam, we only had one deserter, and he was from New York City. He ran off and never came back. I don't know. He's probably mm -hmm. he probably got a little bit of prison time when they caught him. Uh, he was the only one that uh, mm -hmm. deserted us. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, I didn't I didn't have any problem with going. You know I didn't I didn't want to go at first, but after I was there, I knew I was gone. So I just decided I'd take what came to me. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way I experienced the uh, two years in the military that I had. Uh, when I was in high school, we had a bunch of guys gathered up and we were going to go join the National Guard and go to summer camp and do all the things, play soldier. And, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, but uh, we went down to, to join and I was only 17. And my folks wouldn't sign for me because mm. I was underage, you know. Mm. They said, no, we don't want you going in the Army. We want you to go to college and get an education. So I didn't, uh, after that, I never did try to try to uh, get in the Army. And after I got out of high school, I went to college and didn't, I didn't even think about going in the military until I got drafted. And then, mm -hmm. When um, you were in Vietnam, did you get a chance to um, mingle with the local, po the South Vietnamese population a little bit? And what were your impressions? Well, there were some good people over there, and for the most part, they were friendly. Uh, they had gangs, though, and they mm -hmm. would uh, catch a GI or two, you know, walking down the street in some desolate area, and they would try to mob him, you know, mm -hmm. mob these boys. We we had one experience like that. Uh, a, a friend of mine and and I were walking down in, in a kind of a area and there were, weren't any people on the streets. And we looked around and there were a gang of Vietnamese coming toward us from one end of the street. And there was another gang coming from the other end. And about that time, uh, deuce and a half came by and we just jumped on the back of it 
rode on through. <laughs> <laughs> That's a military and, yeah. jeep. Or... No tail. It was a, a truck, okay. a two and a half ton <laughs> truck. But there's no telling what would have happened if mm -hmm. we had, uh, had, if that hadn't happened. Where did that happen, that particular incident? It was in De Da Nang. Da Nang. Mm -hmm. What were your impressions of your officers uh, during this period when you were in Vietnam and your fellow soldiers? Well, when we first got over in Vietnam, we spent all day building bunkers out of, with sand and sandbags. We'd dig out a, a big area, maybe big as this table or you know, twice as wide, and put reinforce it with uh, sandbags and put a top on it where we could escape when a red alert rocket attack was coming in. Well, we got out there and uh, worked all day and some of our officers were laying out there smoking pot, <laughs> these young lieutenants, and boy, we had a red alert that night. Everybody hit the bunker. We ran out to the bunker. There were three of us that were last ones to the bunker. And those officers and the rest of our troops were already in, in the bunker. We couldn't get in, so I said, come on, boys, me and these other two boys. We went back in our tent. And I said, there's nothing we can do. We'll just have to see what comes. That if we get blown up, it will happen. And those two boys, I just laid down on the bunker, on the bed, the bunk, and they they sat down there on the end. And I guess they were scared to death. I wasn't scared because I, I don't know why, but we we waited and waited. Pretty soon, well, the alert was lifted. Here come our our uh, officers, this one young lieutenant that was, you know, kind of intoxicated came out and boy, he jumped on us. He says, you guys are dead. He says, you should have been in that bunker. I said, well, we couldn't get in the bunker because we built the bunker and here you were, you got in there before us and filled it up and we couldn't get in. And boy, he just kept on, kept on. Pretty soon, well, our our first sergeant came in and he he said, what's going on here? And we told him and he jumped on that first lieutenant and ran him out. He told him, oh, he was the second lieutenant, but anyway, he, he ran him out and, you know, I guess he had more rank than that lieutenant did. And boy, he really jumped on that lieutenant. And he protected us and he understood. So we were okay in that situation. But that, wow. That's one of the things that made me feel bad about officers, mm -hmm. you know. Another time, another instance, we were, uh, uh, we were walking across the uh, compound and a huge colonel, he was a uh, Negro, he came by behind, behind us. And well, the other guy was facing me and I, he saluted him. And I didn't turn around and salute him. He jumped onto me pretty good. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't have any problem with that. I knew it was supposed to be done, but I, you know, I didn't have enough experience in the military to know that, you know, maybe I was supposed to turn around. Turn around. <laughs> and salute him, you know. So I didn't and he, he taught me a good lesson, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, when was the first time you, you, you saw combat, it sounds like, just right away, or at least? A... We were there during the Tet Offensive back in 1967. No, it was 68. We went over in 67 and stayed a year. And in 68, February the 1st, they had that, uh, I guess their new year. Mm -hmm. We thought they were celebrating. And we'd heard all of this uh, commotion. We heard these bombs blasting 
or ships out in the ocean, you can see them. Flames come out of the end of those guns, those big high powered guns, and those ships would roll back, recoil. And uh, as it got dark, we thought they were just celebrating the, uh, the New Year. But then we'd see tracers coming toward us. So we kind of took cover and we were in a, there were several of us over guarding a compound or equipment compound which was across the river from our main compound. And uh, we were over there all night and we didn't know what was gonna happen. But there was several battalions of North Vietnamese soldiers in our area that were hiding out in some of the wooded areas around those rice paddies. And uh, our uh, helicopters, shooting that napalm down through those, it would burn those people to, it'd burn their hands off, burn their feet off, and they'd just curl up. Next day we'll downtown at a helicopter pad. When I was going down to pick up some, some supplies, there was a, you know, I was driving a Jeep through there. And I saw all those bodies standing out there. It didn't really bother me too much, except for the smell. It really did, it gives you a bad mm -hmm. smell that you can never, kind of never forget. But uh, the, the smell of burned flesh. And, you know, it's, things like that kind of stay in your mind forever. Mm -hmm. Whenever our boys would get uh, shot up, you know, our Marines over there really had it bad and they'd bring them in on, in these medevac helicopters. And uh, some of them would be already dead whenever they got to the, to the heli helipad. And uh, you just see them, they'd take them off on these stretchers and they'd just be stiff. But, and others, you know, they'd be, you could just see they had bullet holes in them. But we never did, uh, our company, some of the boys probably got out in some of the, uh, the areas where the fighting was pretty severe, but uh, we didn't, uh, most of our headquarters company uh, stayed within the bounds of where we had equipment and mm -hmm. where we had more uh, bases and we just, take that equipment down here and then they would deploy it onto their locations. Mm -hmm. Were, um, you never sustained any injuries then? Not, not from war. Mm -hmm. How did you keep up your morale when it was, things were tough? Well, Sometimes uh, we were based next to an Air Force base. And uh, they, the Air Force tried to uh, keep their morale up pretty good. They'd have uh, base softball games and different things such as that. And they knew that uh, we were, we could play ball. So they'd come over and recruit <laughs> us, they'd bring a, a van over there with a back door to it and we'd just jump in there and they'd take us over to their base and play ball and, and uh, come back. Uh, they'd bring us back after the game and uh, we'd try to help, uh, help out the Air Force that way. <laughs> <laughs> but there were other, you know, we had entertainment there. What kinds of entertainment? Oh, we had some Australian, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, but those dancers, you know, real good looking women, blonde headed, <laughs> had those short cutoffs. And they'd get out there and, and you know, you've seen those uh, Texas Rangerettes and stuff like that, maybe the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. <laughs> That's what they kind of looked like, at least to us. We probably, it probably weren't that good looking, but uh, they'd come and entertain us a little bit on the stage. 
and sometimes we'd have other entertainers. Uh, we had one that was a Filipino guy, and he was kind of a hunchback, a little old skinny guy, and he could sing. He could sing and he'd play different musical instruments. He could sing like Elvis Presley. If you listen to him sing, close your eyes, you could see Elvis Presley or any other, Johnny Cash, you know, any of those guys. He was really talented. He probably couldn't speak English, but he could sing those songs. <laughs> <laughs> did, how'd you stay in touch with your family? Well, I uh, wrote letters. I tried to write home every month, at least, and I'd get letters from them. Once uh, a sister made a German chocolate cake, sent it to us, to me, and uh, we got it in the mail. I don't know how long it'd been in the, <laughs> in the transit getting there, but we got it in the mail and, and us, this guy brought this to me, this package to me and said, here's your mail. And I looked at it, didn't know what it was. I said, okay. So I started opening it, those guys gathered around. There's about three or four of us there. They all gathered around and and you could see the icing. Oh, German chocolate cake. And boy, <laughs> one of them just grabbed into it and started eating it. We all did. And then we said, save a piece for one of our buddies that's gonna be coming in here in a little while. So we all got through eating our piece of cake and pretty soon our buddy came in and. We told him, he said, here, we saved you a piece of this German chocolate cake. So he got it, picked it up, looked at it. He said, well, I'm not going to eat that. So why not? He said, well, it's molded. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, eat, we had eaten a molded cake. Of course, we were in a tent, and it was dark in there, and we couldn't see that it was molded. Oh, that's, that's an incredible story. <laughs> Right, that was another question I had, actually, is what, what was the food like over there? Well, the hamburgers, they weren't like hamburgers here. They tasted different. The, the Coca-Colas didn't taste like Coca-Cola here, although they were in the same can. Uh, I guess uh, it was okay, but it wasn't home. It was foreign food. I did uh, have an opportunity to, uh, I met this guy who was a Korean Marine and he had a villa downtown and we got acquainted and he invited me to come down to his villa and he had some kind of game. It was on a little board, had squares on it and looked like he had buttons. And I don't know what the name of the game was, but him and him and another Korean, they could really play it. I never could catch on, but they had food there. And uh, it looked like, uh, actually it looked like spinach, but it was, it had a little meat in it, it looked like beef, and it probably was water buffalo. But he dished me a bowl of that out and I ate it, and it was pretty good, but it was really hot in season, and uh, I went ahead and ate it because I like hot seasoned food, you know, and uh, that was my experience with, with that kind of food, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty good. Did you always have adequate supplies? And and at, at our base we did. We had plenty of uh, food. Uh, we had Vietnamese to do our kitchen police duties, KP. And uh, we had our own cooks. Uh, they were American military cooks, but uh, all the uh, cleanup and stuff, we used to uh, contract labor, I guess, would mm -hmm. be what you call it. Yeah. Was there anything special you did for good luck? I don't know of anything special that I did for good luck. Uh, I guess I was just lucky. 
maybe uh, maybe my folks or somebody from back home put Indian medicine on me before I went over there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Gave me some kind of protection, mm -hmm. but but it seemed like that because I'd had several instances where I could have been done away with, captured or whatever. I mean, I don't know why. I, the my sergeant told me to go across the river and get a load of sand. And he told me where it was at, so I went over there and I didn't see any sand. He said, there's a backhoe there and they'll load that sand up in the back of that truck, a deuce and a half, two and a half ton truck. So I went over there and I didn't see anything. There wasn't any equipment there where he told me to go, so I kept going. And I drove off of the compound, the uh, military base out into a community and there were a lot of people there and I just thought I said you know I probably shouldn't be down here so I just wheeled that truck around and there was no equipment anyway so I took off and went back but I made sure that my rifle was sitting close to me where they could see it but they you know I didn't have any problem with them uh, but I could have if, mm -hmm. you know, the wrong people had been there. Right. But I went on back, told him, told my sergeant that there was no, no equipment over where he sent me. But uh, I guess I went a little bit too far. But I didn't have a problem, so. We did have experience with uh, some of our Puerto Rican soldiers Every, seemed like every month, one of them would be, would drown in the uh, South China Sea. I guess they'd go out too far and they'd mm. panic and couldn't get back and drown. They'd be swimming uh, yeah. for recreational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They let us go down on, like on a Sunday afternoon and, and uh, we'd swim or they had a few sailboats you could rent take them out and float around a little bit. I never did get a chance to use one of them, but they were there. Do you uh, remember the day that your service ended? Yes, I do. I was in, we flew back from Vietnam. It took us like 26 hours from uh, Cameron Bay. We flew to Tokyo, Japan refueled, flew to, uh, I guess it was uh, oh, one of those Alaskan cities. What is that big city in Alaska? Mm, wouldn't be Juneau or Anchorage? I think it was Anchorage, Alaska, refueled, and then flew to Seattle. And they turned us loose. And they said, told us, he said, whenever you get get off of the plane be sure to travel in pairs because there will be people there trying to take advantage of you and if you have money they will roll you take your money especially in restrooms and at, you know once you get out of the airport or in the airport but i didn't know of anybody getting robbed after we got out. So then we flew from uh, Seattle to uh, Oklahoma City. I don't know where we stopped. We must have stopped someplace. But that was the kind of the end of my military. <laughs> and they didn't ask me to come back. I don't know why. <laughs> I think I was too old. I was 24 years old when I got drafted. Mm. And uh, I didn't, you know, I thought it was a good experience. I actually, after I got out of the military, went back to work at uh, Foster Wheeler Corporation. I stayed down there about three months and decided I needed to do something different. So I checked in on my uh, GI Bill, Educational Opportunities through the military, and I used that to get back in school and finish school. Right. 
and spent a few years in business then too working for yeah. what was your when you first got home um, what was that like first getting home it was like uh, a good feeling my folks were glad I was home I stayed with them uh, every morning when I'd get out of when I'd get up, they'd already have breakfast cooked and have me a cup of coffee sitting on the table, which I never drank coffee before then. <laughs> so in order to be sociable, I started drinking coffee. That's when I started drinking coffee. And I still drink coffee today, so <laughs> it didn't, I guess I created a habit or they helped me create a habit. Were there any special doings at church or anything that no you remember? I can't remember anything that happened you know as a result of coming back from the war in fact I think that uh, uh, the soldiers of that era were treated bad mm -hmm. like you guys are trash you know today when they come back we welcome them back have big celebrations during that era we didn't have any of that. It was like, you know, you guys, mm -hmm. I guess it was maybe the, uh, it was just the attitude toward toward the military at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, they did have some, uh, some of those massacres where some of our troops would shoot civilians and get charged for it and have trials here in the United States. And, you know, that probably had something to do with it. But if people were, Actually, if they got to experience those, uh, what went on in the war zones, they would understand why those kind of things happened. And uh, I think that you can't blame those boys. They were uh, trained to protect themselves, trained to fight war, trying to fight the battle. And... Uh, Sometimes they didn't recognize you couldn't identify the enemy. And they were just, I think they were more or less protecting themselves, although it looked bad for them. Were things a little bit different though within the Creek community or the Native community in terms of your reception when you got home? Yeah. My uncle was really happy to see me. <laughs> was this on your dad or mom's side? My mother's brother. Okay. Yeah, he was <laughs> he was proud of me because I went and yeah. you know got to experience that. I've had a lot of uh, relatives that were uh, military that joined the military and went. He was one of them. My other, my dad's brothers, they all went. My dad was too old whenever uh, World War One. Well, oh, he's too young in World War One, too mm -hmm. old in World War Two, so he didn't. He never served. But uh, then I had cousins. His sisters' boys were all in the military. So you know, we had pretty good, pretty good representation in the military from our family side. Mm -hmm. And you know, like George Bunny, he was a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever went to the war, any wars, but uh, he was uh, in a pretty rough combat training mm -hmm. cycle. And his brothers were uh, military. One that just passed uh, last year, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, Newman, mm -hmm. not Newman, yeah, Newman. They called him Doc, mm -hmm. Doc Bunny. You know, he was an MP over in Germany. And, uh, you know, they trained him to, he was trained to serve and honor the <laughs> United States military. And if he gave an order, you know, he expected those other troops to follow him. <laughs> they sent him to, a, as an MP, they sent him to a club. This, this black guy was, and I should, probably shouldn't even say this on a, on an interview, so if you get a chance to... Yeah, we can pause it or... Yeah, well, anyway, he, he uh, this big black guy was messing with one of those blonde-headed German women and 
you know, troops in there were getting after him, and they didn't like it, but he was so big that they couldn't do anything about it. So they sent him down there to arrest that guy. And uh, he told him, he says, you need to come with me. We've got to go on taking you in. And uh, that uh, guy says, no, you're not doing anything to me. And he, so he started walking toward Doc, and he pulled his pistol out. And he said, okay, stop. And that guy kept coming, and he says, told you to stop. He kept coming. Shot him right between the eyes and killed him. And they they gave him dishonorable discharge, sent him home. And uh, later on, there was, I don't know who came to his defense, but they uh, overturned those charges and sent him back over there. Mm -hmm. Did you join a veterans organization when you got back? Uh, no. I didn't. Uh, I've been to, uh, well, I did actually, the VFW in Henrietta. Mm -hmm. One of my cousins paid my uh, fee to be in that organization, and we went out and we would go bowling, uh, like on Tuesday and Thursday nights down in Henrietta, and he ran the VFW club. And he paid my fees, membership fees, and so I went down there a couple of times with him, but <laughs> man, I couldn't stand to be in there. <laughs> and you didn't join a Native Veterans uh, group? No, I never did that. Uh, I didn't f feel like I needed any kind of, to do anything like that would do anything for me as far as what I've done in my life. Most of the things I wanted to do, I've done. I don't, you know, don't have any regrets for what I've done in, in my life. And not being a part of that, you know, I'm, I guess I really didn't have that type of uh, 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 feeling for the military. And that's probably the reason why they didn't ask me to re-enlist. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it's important to share your experiences as a veteran? Well, I think that uh, people need to know how you felt about what you did and uh, to know some of the things that went on in, in the military. Everyone doesn't get to express themselves. I think that, uh, uh, you know, even a lot of my folks don't know So, you know, if they ever have opportunity to hear what I have to say, well, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind. What would you like people to know or remember from your story? I would like them to remember that uh, for a young person growing up, that if, if they need to mature, I think the military is one good place to do it because you get all kinds of discipline, you get uh, responsibilities, you, uh, you have to take orders, uh, you have to learn. There's many different things you learn in the, in the military. They give you classes. You get to experience situations that uh, may not be too pleasant, such as uh, uh, gas training, tear gas training, different things like that, nerve gas training. You get to uh, experience hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. You, you fire weapons. You know how to tear these weapons apart, put them back together, clean them. Things like that are, are pretty important, I think, to a young, man, young person growing up. And I know today we have both men and women in the military, and, and they all get to experience the same things. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else we should talk about? Anything? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not too much. Probably some things we 
that doesn't apply to the military, but uh, I did come uh, go to the VA hospital in uh, Muskogee to get me a medical card or health card so I could go there if I needed to. And uh, one of the doctors said, asked me a question. He says, where's your uh, primary? He said, do you have any, any kind of uh, medical problems? I said, yes, I'm a diabetic. And he said, where's your, uh, where's your, where do you go to get your treatment? I said, Okmogi Indian Health Clinic. He says, well, why are you over here? I said, because I'm a veteran. And he didn't say anything after that. But I think uh, many times those guys, they want to make some of, some of the people may not understand what you went through to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're looking out for their own workload. And if they feel that way, then they shouldn't even be in the serving the, in getting paid by the military to in the VA to serve and uh, provide health care to veterans. Yeah, thank, thank but you. But I think things have changed since then. You know, they do have uh, memorandums of agreement that they will both honor if honor okay. your uh, person that's been in the military and they, you know, if you need more uh, health care, then they would be glad to provide that service for you if you can't get it at the local Indian clinic. Mm -hmm. So I think IHS and VA have mm -hmm. come to an agreement. So things change. Yeah, that was something that needed to change, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, thank you very much, Bill, for your time today. Well, you're welcome.